to the Welcome to the sixth workshop in the School Garden Mentorship Workshop series this year. It seems like so long ago that it was February and we were designing school gardens and now it's June and hopefully you are starting to eat some of the fruits of your labor um, and actually harvesting your first crops from the school garden. Today we are talking about spring harvest and celebrations and it's a fun topic. This wasn't part of the workshop series last year so we've had a, a great time kind of creating new content for this workshop today. Before we dive into it, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Cowitzid Nation who have lived here since time immemorial. I'm a second generation settler living on this land and I know this land is the lifeline of the Cowitzid people who have their life, their culture, their language, their ancestors, their future generations all in, inextricably woven into this land. So I wanna acknowledge that. Um, I work with Farm to School BC as the Central Island Community Animator. I have a background in outdoor education and classroom teaching and also farming. And it's such a joy that I found this job that gets to bring all those three passions together. Um, and it's been really great working through the School of Grand Mentorship Series with you all this year. And I pass it over to Kaylin to acknowledge the territory she's calling in from and share a little bit about herself. Hi everyone, it's great to see you again. Um, my name is Kaylin Pierce. I'm the Food Literacy Advisor with Farm to School BC, new Food Literacy Advisor. Um, and I'm also a teacher in School District 39, and I'm joining you here from the traditional um, ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thanks, Galen. Before we jump into the workshop, um, I just want to take a moment to give folks a little overview of Farm to School BC. So Farm to School BC is a program of the Public Health Association of BC and is supported by the province of British Columbia. Farm to School BC is a program that brings healthy local sustainable food into schools across BC. We provide students with hand-on learning opportunities that develop food literacy. We strengthen the local food system and enhance school and community connectedness. Um, and we do this work by supporting schools and community partners through webinars, grants, professional development opportunities, conferences, consultation, networking, communication, the list goes on. We have a wonderful, flexible job, um, and we really engage on the ground in the community, connecting resources and needs. Farm to School BC is organized into eight regional hubs across BC, and each regional hub is supported by a community animator, as well as a network of stakeholders. Here's a quick overview of the staff team supporting the Farm to School BC programs. Uh, you can learn more about your hub, connect with your community animator, and learn more about Farm to School BC in general by going to our website. Okay, there's our preamble. It's time to jump now into today's workshop on spring harvest traditions and celebrations. So we have a full agenda today, as per usual. Um, we'll be starting off with Farmer Brown, Chris Brown, speaking on harvest traditions, and we'll introduce him in a minute. Um, after that, Kaylin's going to jump in and talk about June harvest celebrations and garden tours. Chris is going to talk more generally about harvest traditions, and then Kaylin's going to bring it more into context for where we are right now in the school year. Um, and Kaylin's going to round that out with sharing some great garden recipes. And then I will come on and talk about supporting the staff, supporting gardens through staff turnover, which is such a common challenge that school gardens experience. We're gonna talk about how we can build resilience um, in our school garden, both in our people and our plants. So without further ado, I'm delighted to have Farmer Brown join us as a guest speaker today. Chris is one of those people with just this huge deep well of experience. And I swear it's over his back pocket's just like overflowing with tips and tricks. I don't know how he's accumulated so many amazing ideas throughout the years. Um, and he just seems to effortlessly have this way of weaving hands-on curriculum across the subject um, and tying in his experience as a farmer, a teacher, an activist, and now also a parent into the work that he does. Um, so I will hand it over to Chris to take it away for us. Awesome, thanks Tessa. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Christopher Brown. My community name is Farmer Brown, and I'm finding that it's really serving me well as an elementary educator to, to have to present with that name. And, um, you know, it's it's really fun. Um, so I'm a uh, my background is in anthropology and then I became a market gardener because I believed that was uh, um, the best way to make a positive contribution to our community. I'm starting my timer right now. Um, 
And now I'm a, a teacher. I'm a fairly new teacher. This year I was teaching grade two, three. Next year I'm teaching grade five, six. So I'm actually moving schools, um, which is the new teacher's challenge. So this garden that we've built up at Nanus is going to be passed on, hopefully to people who can continue to, to manage it. And um, I'm a new dad. So um, as one parent I heard say recently, it's I'm never you're never fully present. So my my toddler's in the next room. So bear with me if, if needed. Okay, uh, can you continue, Tessa? So um, I would like to make some recognition. So um, I'm presenting from the traditional territory of the Sinemok people. And specifically, I'm in Departure Bay, and that's called Shklitlip, uh, which means deep water. And I want to give a recognition to uh, the district who employs me, School District 69. I'm really grateful for the support I've had to do uh, professional development and continue to do the garden work there. And I also want to recognize Farm to School BC, who um, I've been collaborating with for the last four and a half years or so, and really grateful to work with passionate people who really care about this. Tessa, that picture you had um, of celebrations, that's in the Barsby Garden, and it's like, well, I helped plant some of those plants, so it's it's cool to see things still happening. I was hoping you noticed that picture, Chris. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's a great one. Um, and I also want to recognize all the people who are showing up today um, for your time. You're, you are knowledge keepers and teachers and um, I'm doing my master's in home economics education right now, and I'm, I'm exploring this concept of earth service. By participating in earth service, we're generating abundance and um, creating a new economic paradigm. Um, if you can continue, please. So I'm going to be presenting about um, uh, school harvest traditions. And the first thing I want to recognize is make new traditions. So the thing that um, inspired me to come up with this concept was, in, in our school on St. Patrick's Day, they were making leprechaun traps. And it's like, I feel this was not, I didn't really feel this was very appropriate. And so it's like, let's do something better than make leprechaun traps. Well, why don't we plant a pot of gold? So we, in this picture, you can see these are the potatoes, the Yukon gold potatoes we planted um, to come up with a new idea other than making leprechaun traps. So on Valentine's Day, why not plant peas on earth? And for St. Patrick's Day, Yukon gold potatoes, plant a pot of gold. And on Easter, plant Easter egg radishes. These are all new traditions that replace the let's eat junk food in school traditions that create generate waste. And then you can see um, there's a book called Ugly Food that a local author wrote. And then we took all these funky farm veggies from a local vet, uh, farmer, put googly eyes on them, did a bunch of literacy stories about them, and then we we juiced them and then we drank uh, carrot blood after that. So we were all vegan vampires and the kids loved it. Uh, next, please. So I'm um, the broad bean. I'm, I'm so passionate about broad beans. It's like my spirit legume. And uh, we've been, people have been growing broad beans for 8,000 years. And I've generated a whole bunch of lesson plans based on them. They're their life cycle coincides so well with the school year. So you can plant broad beans in October, November, they overwinter, they sprout in the spring, and then um, you can monitor them, go through their life cycle. You can eat the young leaves, you can measure them, do all sorts of math and observation activities with them. Then they flower, so there's the pollinators, and then they set their fruit, which you can eat fresh, but then, our school garden is likely just to go dry in the summer from lack of participation, which is okay because then the broad beans dry out. And then when we come back to school in September, we can harvest the bean pods and you can see there's a diversity of colors. So then we can do all sorts of literacy or sort of math and numeracy activities with them and then start the cycle again. So I've uploaded a bunch of these lesson plans um, to the BCTF website. Uh, and I wrote an article, which I included some ideas about these in the Teach Magazine. And um, in the picture, that's our school garden. In the bottom left, there's a bed that's full of broad beans. And um, it's they're just a wonderful, wonderful bean uh, food to grow. Next, please. Um, so there's this concept of waste, which uh, is like waste goes away. It goes into a pile. And so I'm trying to challenge this concept of we're harvesting waste. We're turning waste into a resource. So in the top right, that's a picture of a, it's called a hungry bin. It's a worm composter. And we have two at our school. They were inside for a while. Um, then they started to have a bit of a scent because they weren't fully managed to the best of their ability. 
um, but they live in the garden now and, and we are feeding the worms. And in the bottom right, you can see, the, I call that a compost cupcake. And so th th we were generating so much paper towel from, from COVID and all the hand washing. So this is a strategy of um, soil building and turning a waste into a resource and also vertical farming. Um, so we made this big corral, filled it with, with all our food, our, our paper towel and, and food wrapper waste, and then covered it with some soil and compost. And we've since planted a pollinator garden on the top of it. And then next year, the idea is we'll disassemble it, harvest the biomass, use it in the garden and build another one. So I think in this bit, this container alone, we've probably diverted over 300 bags, plastic bags worth of paper towel. So the, the, the big idea is how can we turn waste? Um, what's the introduction to waste management literacy, which is a major challenge of our future? Next, please. Um, yeah, and then I see that your comment there, compost cupcake, then it comes this whimsical idea. And I find it's really important to introduce new language um, that these learners are going to take with them. So at our school, we have these four small maple trees. And from those four small maple trees, we have managed to make maple syrup. And this is probably like, you know, my biggest brag here because making local maple syrup, amazing, right? So here's my grade two students. We drilled the hole. They, they're they tapping the spigot, the sp the spee, the spy, the spigot into the tree. Then we um, hang the bucket, we collect the maple water. Then it introduces all sorts of uh, big ideas around asking the tree permission, taking enough um, first principle, first person's principles of um, taking enough, leaving enough for the tree. We, we get to do numeracy things where we're observing, uh, graphing how much we're collecting, and, and then we do ratios as we reduce it. And then there's the science connections of uh, phase of matter shifts. So um, here's the students collecting water. We um, we reduced it in the bottom left. You can see there's the maple syrup. It was incredibly delicious. And then we had a, a waffle party. So super fun. Um, and the kids are just like constantly checking it out. So you know, I, I wrote in there the circular seasons. You know, our calendar is a, is a rectangle. And which doesn't really jive with like the reality of our world, you know, the four directions circle, the medicine wheel. And so um, every year in January, you can anticipate the maple harvest. Every February, it's shellfish. Every March, it's the herring spawn. Every April, it's April, it's stinging nettle. And if we can support our learners into getting into these cycles, these circular traditional cycles, um, then then that create that's creating again a new tradition. And um, so wherever you have a nearby wild space, honor those spaces and try to get your learners into them, especially from a young age, because then they can observe it over their their school uh, time. Uh, next, please. So uh, we do a lot of seed saving in our garden. And it's actually, I'm turning kind of like a negative into a positive. So this is a picture of our garden, the bottom picture from Saturday. Uh, hosted a work party there and you can see the kale on the right is, is in full seed making mode and um, I'm, I'm okay with the garden drying out now because I'm mostly planting perennials anticipating moving into the next school and um, it uh, so that's going to give the the annuals the chance to to dry out and we'll collect the seed and um, you can see in the top the, in you can see the students on this on the chair there's a a jar full of painted mountain corn seed and the students are sorting it based on color and size and then we're doing a data this is grade two three we're doing a data collection um, and engaging with data and observation and it's so cool how they uh, sorted things based on colors and size and then they collaborated on it and it became a whole class um, as Megan Zenny called it, it, it was an emergent learning opportunity. It wasn't what I planned. The students took it on. And so seeds are just, um, as Dr. Vandana Shiva says, they are the from which all life arises. And it's if you can if you can bring seeds into your school, into the library, and into classrooms and gift them to the students and get them learning how to use them, there's so many different things with them. So, yeah, we have like um, a time for students to chill out, call it catch the calm. And during catch the calm, it's like, okay, we're going to clean seeds. 
So here's the pods and they're using their hands. They're shucking them into bins. I'm teaching them how to do the winnowing. So they're working with the wind. And these are all skills that are thousands of years old. So sorting and cleaning, data collection, interpretation, and patterning, they can use them for art. You know, with the broad beans, it's like one's purple and one's white, but they can still be friends just the same. So they're creating narratives with them. Um, for math, you can do uh, collections of them. Germination, take 100 seeds. How many germinate? What's the germination percentage? And um, we, I, I wasn't able to do this, but you know, what does a seed drive look like? Asking everyone to bring your seeds to the school, let's create a seed bank and then start a seed library in our school and, and then distribute it among to, to people. Um, next slide, please. I am going kind of fast. Um, microgreens. So this is uh, this kit here in the picture. They're about $200 and you can get a harvest of microgreens in about nine days. Um, buying the microgreen seed mixes, or if you collect all that kale seed, you can grow your own microgreens. So then it's like a zero, you don't have to purchase seeds. So you're bringing in this concept of seed sovereignty. So having one of these kits in your classroom, they're super quick. Um, again, you can do data collection and, and there's lots of math opportunities for weight and um, change over time. And uh, these are also spaces for uh, like mini greenhouse propagation. So you can start your tomatoes and basil and peppers and other uh, early season stuff in there that you can transplant into the garden. And um, all sorts of science learning opportunities with light. You can deprive them of light, what happens. Um, you can leave the light on, what happens uh, over water. And so it gives lots of learning opportunities. But uh, this is called a sun blaster grow set. And they're about $200. And um, again with like the worm bin these are things that uh, it becomes a resource for the school and so our pack has supported us in purchasing some of these things and we also got a, a learning grant um, through farm to school bc for um for some of these purchases uh, next please tessa so um this concept um i'm really working to decolonize my perspectives on teaching and, and farming and you know the traditional farming technique is drain the drain the wetland dominate the ecosystem grow the straight lines and I really want to get away from that and become more of farming as a relationship building experience and through that realization I'm having other realizations and it's like you know what can this plant give me is kind of the first question what can I can I eat it what does it give me? And it's like, I trying to encourage this concept of, well, what can we do with it? It's not just for us. It's also for the non-human nations. It's for the pollinator and the insect nations. And so I'm, I'd like to argue that an, an outcome, a harvest celebration outcome, um, an experience is, a, is an outcome. Um, having a sensory experience or a moment with a plant or getting to observe it over time, that is an outcome. That's that's part of the harvest. And you can see in this picture, this this is from February. And you know, in the bottom left, that's May. And it's it's amazing how quick the space changes over time. And being able to show the students, you know, here's the before and after and how things change, like that, that is an outcome. That's part of a harvest celebration. And again, you're bringing in this the medicine wheel, the four seat, four directions, the four seasons. And um, I think um, I mean, I'm introducing new language like, you know, the insect nation and the plant nation. And that was I, I that was inspired from the book Braiding Sweetgrass. So if anyone hasn't read that book, it's I definitely put it on your reading list because it's just like relationship building with nature and so gratitude based, um, so much gratitude based. and you know, now the students come into the garden and they've created these little emergent activities for themselves. So they they do this thing where they create a, a they call it a vegan taco. So they take the biggest edible leaf they can find and they go around the garden finding smaller things. So the calendula petals, that's the cheese. And then the blue borage flowers, that's an ingredient and the fennel and the lettuce and a pea and a raspberry. And then they roll it up and they're like, amazing. And, you know, you see the kids and their teeth are green and they're like eating, eating, eating this green food. And now we just go into the garden and they just do it on their own. So we've created this, this, 
this new tradition when we come into the garden. And then in the bottom right, we have that, those are the attendees of the work party. And it's, um, I'm, I'm really, thank goodness these folks came out because an email went out to the whole school community. And it's, it's, we get like one or two people that come out to the garden. And it's just like, man, like, and I'm volunteering my time to try to train some folks to care for this space. And people, I'm hearing people say it's important, but it's just like, come on, we gotta, we gotta get fired up about this space. Cause um, honestly, like I'd, I'd be out there every single day if I could. And um, I think every district needs to have someone whose job it is, is to take, take care of these garden spaces. So, you know, I say to most of my, in most of my presentations is um, you are now all ad ambassadors for this cause. And I think if we have a common voice, which is these spaces are important, my learners benefit from going to these spaces, um, they enjoy it. Um, joy is, an, is the, they're, they're experiencing joy and uh, learning life skills. Um, we, we need more of this. Uh, next, please, Tessa. And um, another tradition uh, is eating together. So um, someone suggested this, you take your, so you get all the desks in your classroom and you arrange them in a long table and then you sit down and you eat with your students. And many people don't have family dinners anymore. And you as teachers are one of the most positive influences in their lives. And if you're able to sit with them and eat with them, it's kind of like a family dinner and it's, it's unifying and relationship building in your classroom. And um, we've hosted some potlucks where people bring something in or a salad bar where you go to the garden, you harvest as a, as a classroom, and then you could make a salad bar or tacos work really well um, for using things from the garden. And then if you're doing microgreens, the, those are also really easy to incorporate um, in, in some of your, your meals. Um, in this picture, the students are transplanting borage plants. So borage is a must in every garden. Uh, they refill their nectaries every two minutes. So a bee can come to it, drink its fill of nectar, go to another flower, and two minutes later, the previous nectary is full. Nectary, isn't that a cool word? Whereas sunflowers, it takes a day for, to refill their nectary. So um, borage is a great, a great plant and you can eat the flowers. And the Romans believed it gave you courage eating the young leaves. So the students are taking a, a plant home to plant in their garden and then it's gonna seed and naturalize. So um, it's, it's just amazing how much abundance gardens can offer. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so I'm, there's my 18 minutes right on time. So my kind of big idea I want to leave you with is, you know, teach students gardening skills in the classroom that they can bring home. And so my learners are, are going home to their parents and they're saying, this is important to me. I'm advocating, um, sorry, the students are, are advocating for themselves saying that this is important. And um, Patty, I'm reading your comment that I, I didn't know that. Is that a true story? We, we, that uh, Braveheart ate the leaves before going into battle. Yeah, you read the you read the plant thing on borage, and it says it gives you courage. So we we've been actually making a tea, a herbal tea, in our class on Fridays, where we go in the garden, we pick all the things, we make a tea, and then we drink it. And having all these great twos and threes saying they love the tea, it's so incredible. Um, but here's the here's the what I'd like to impart with you is. You know, I'm getting feedback from parents telling how their children now want to garden um, because they're having this experience at the school and then going home and saying it's important. So we're we're planting this seed with our learners and we're revealing a pathway for self-sufficiency, care for ourselves and the non-human nations and, and meaningful leisure time, but also life and career skills. So there's the painted mountain corn. It says thanks. Um, that's from my friend Jake at Earthcraft Farm. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And Tessa, thank you for inviting me to speak. And we can we can ask some questions. Or... Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I feel like I have so many questions and I'm sure others do too. I feel like you just open up this well of other ideas that come up with all the things that you bring forward. Um, I really like your suggestion of thinking of the harvest as the whole experience engaging in the garden, not just the outcome of what are you harvesting, but that experience that we're having in the garden through that process. Um, a nectary, I had no idea. <laughs> great word. And great to know a little bit more about borage too. 
Um, we have a couple minutes if any folks on the call want to ask Chris a question. You're welcome to put it in the chat bar and I can read it out um, or you can unmute yourself and ask Chris that way. What's your favorite activity, Chris, to do? Top number one. Like a structured activity or an informal activity? Either. I, I just think being in the garden is so valuable and just creating space to be in that garden. And, um, you know, I'm led, I've, at first I was like, we have to do something structured in this space, but now it's like the space is creating the opportunities. And so this is my third year um, having now restored the garden, it's full of plants and learning opportunities. And the students are, you know, I'll prompt them, but now they're able to kind of experience things on their own. And um, um, so I think just Im 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 the opportunity to be there is my favorite ex activity. Mm. But then the students also teach each other things too. And, you know, you'll see one student doing something and then others will mimic them. And then and it just kind of spirals into this, this whole experience. So immersion. And I'm, being from Ontario, we're envious about the all the winter opportunities when we're still under snow. Yeah, totally. So I am, we are really lucky here. You know, this is the Mediterranean of Canada. And um, I think just what, yeah, working with your local ecosystems, um, strengths is kind of what you can the best you can do um i see that what kind of plants did you use for the tea so we have mint lemon balm calendula fennel um, and borage flowers and you know i've taught the kids as well you know you can go to the rosemary plant and just pull your hand up the stalk and then smell it and rosemary is an antidepressant and it also wakes you up so I'm teaching the kids how to take a herb piece, like a like a medicine herb, like rosemary, and crush it amongst their hands, and then smell it, and then put it on their 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 clothes, so that they can continuously smell that rosemary over time. And um, it's kind of cool. They're you see them just like watching them do it, and they're they're doing it on their own now. And those are great perennial plants. So as we're later on in this conversation talking about dealing with uh, staff turnover around school gardens. So we need to think of some of these plants as really hardy perennial plants that are there for the students year after year. Yeah, so um, Sonia, I see your question there. So our, um, we kind of, we have two composts. One is the worm compost, which is inside our school garden or inside a classroom. And that's where the food waste goes. Red wrigglers can only eat certain things, so they can't eat citrus or pizza crusts or things like that, for example. And then the compost cupcake is more for our carbon, so that's for pizza boxes and wrappers. And then you kind of got to do it as a lasagna, so you do cardboard and paper towel and then some wood chips and some some something that'll help accelerate the decomposition. And we just do it over time. And then I've been getting the kids to jump on it. So the kids jump on it and have this great experience. And then, um, and then at the end of the school year, we've been planting a cover crop on top of it. But yeah, there's concern, like we've planted apple trees and then it's like, well, we gotta be careful because bears will come and eat the apples. And just like, maybe, can we just like not worry about that and just like grow some apple trees because then that's a really super hopeful thing to do. Um, so yeah, um, you can build rat proof composts as well. And um you just got to be really careful because I think once you have a negative experience, like there was fruit flies in our compost and it was a whole thing because there was fruit flies. And so you could, you, you know, you got to, got to find that balance. <laughs> Hope that helps. Um, hydroponic growing. Yeah. So you, you can do it. I haven't done it personally. I've seen it done before successfully. And um, I'm a soil builder, so it's really important for me to work with the soil, but I know that's not always a reality or possibility. So you could create a, a high, hydroponic ecosystem, or um, I'm, I'm actually thinking of aquaponic, where you would have fish, um, fish with greens growing on top of them. And you can do that with like a 10 gallon aquarium with some lettuce plants on top. And then if you can learn how to do that, you can scale it up. But I haven't done hydroponic before, uh, to Anthony's comment. 
Chris, I'm going to have to end the questions there, just looking at our time. But sure. thank you so much. I feel like every time I hear you speak, I just have new possibilities arising in my mind. Um, yeah, well, I'm really we're... left with thinking about the fava bean and the cycle of the school and how well those line up when often that's something we're challenged by linking plant life cycles and school life cycles. So thank you for sharing your inspiration today. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for your questions and your time. Awesome. And Kaylin, I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tessa. And thank you, Chris. I really, I really liked the way that you were talking about thinking about celebration sort of and harvest in a experiential kind of way and in a relational kind of way. I think like as I'm a new teacher myself too, and I think um, it can feel like things are very outcome based in a school system where we're thinking about, especially in June, we're writing report cards um, and I think it can be nice to be kind of brought back into that frame of mind to be able to think about like how we're connecting with each other um, in the garden space and how we're inviting people into that space and what kind of posture we're holding when we're doing that. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate like the generative way in which you're communicating those things. So thank you so much. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, as a teacher, I'm really like aware of the fact that June is a busy time of year. And I think with these harvest celebration and tour ideas, um, it's definitely not meant to be like, here's more that you can do, but really trying to think about those things of like, what are we already doing and how are we connecting those things together? But I think also thinking like, you know, Chris, I really liked the way you were talking about how, um, how you build new traditions. So I think the school year can be like quite dominant and thinking about like, okay, like June is the end and we're all coming towards this end thing. But um, yeah, there are already some really nice um, or some traditions that you might have in your school or things that might be happening in June where you could find ways of like inviting people into the garden or bringing um, aspects of what you're doing in the garden into those celebrations. Uh, and really just finding ways, however large or small, of, um, of recognizing the work that you've been doing together in that space. Uh, Tessa, if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so yeah, thinking about these kind of two ideas of thinking about ways of sharing food or sharing um, what you've been growing and ways of being together. And that could be as simple as just going to that space and being in that space. I know for me that sometimes when things feel overwhelming too, it's just nice to kind of like go there and not it, have it be pressured with like doing. Um, and, um, but uh, Tessa, if you can go to the next slide. Um, these are some things that I know like in our school um, that are celebrations that are already happening. So thinking about things like volunteer recognition, um, graduation ceremonies, uh, student leadership recognition that might be happening, um, opportunities for food and recipe sharing. I know we have some celebrations in our school um, that are already scheduled um, uh, that have food as a central focus point. Um, thinking about in, like ELA kind of things with poetry, book sharing, um, general year-end reflections and sports day. Um, so I'm going to share two sort of ideas with you here of ways that you could kind of combine um, things that might be happening in your school already, um, and then ways of kind of bringing them into the garden. Great. Tessa, if you can switch to the next slide. Great. Um, so this is a really uh, kind of simple idea, and it's kind of connecting to, I think, um, especially this time of year, thinking about like, um, what's available for us in the garden? What do we have a volume of and what are we able to take from that space um, in order to make something together? Um, so uh, lots of schools have sports day um, and it's a really, it's an established tradition. Thinking about like how you might pro go through that process. So um, maybe you would initiate by talking to your sports day committee. Um, you could go through a process of harvesting those herbs with your class or with student leaders. So for example, like in our school garden, we have an ample amount of lemon balm. And that's something that you can kind of go through that process of collecting uh, and preparing. Um, then you're able to think through like brewing that tea and chilling it in advance. So that's not something you have to do on the day of sports day. 
And then um, kind of going through a process of maybe building a script or developing signage or thinking with your students, how might you tell other students about what that process is, what this plant is that you've used, um, how you've gone through the process of collecting it, um, and then having this opportunity to share and serve the tea and be together in that. And I really liked, I really like thinking about that as when we're consuming or we're things can get caught up again in being consuming what we're doing, but also um, I think thinking through like how we're doing that together, um, what are the things that have brought us together in that way is really nice too. Um, another idea that I have done with my class um, is connecting sort of our garden activity in with thinking about a poetry unit that we were already doing. Um, I really love poetry, and I think it's a really great way to kind of connect to some of the experiences you might be having in the garden. Um, so in this uh, in this case, what we did is we had been students had been writing poems, making small books to be able to share. And what we did one day is we extended our lunch hour. Um, we went out into the garden um, during lunchtime and then uh, carried that over and had an opportunity to eat food together, share some food together. And then students were able to share some of the poems that they wrote. So there's so much in the garden to be inspired by. And I think connecting like language acquisition, language learning to those things, it's like language acquisition in context. And I think that can be really powerful for uh, like language learning. Um, so uh, on the next slide, we've made a couple more. Uh, I've made a couple poems here just to kind of get your brain thinking about what that might look like. So these are a couple haikus that I made thinking about how you could be sort of not only like writing, just writing poems for your peers to consume, but also thinking like, what if you're writing a poem to the vegetables and to the fruit, to the garden? And I think I, I find that like a really generative way to engage with language and poetry writing in the garden. So these are a couple that I've written uh, like, uh, and you can read them there. I won't do my poetry reading out loud, but I do think that poetry readings can be really fun um, even for shy students, I think it's an opportunity to get to like practice performance and, and even for those comedians in your class, it can be a really great opportunity. Uh, next slide, Tessa. Um, so extending this idea from like thinking about ways, different ways of sort of the way of thinking about this is how we're inviting people into the garden and how we're bringing the garden kind of outward into the community that we have. Um, but class tours can be a really great way to think through some of those, um, the curriculum things that we're having to approach as teachers. And at, for me, like assessment is a thing that I like, it's my least favorite part of the job. And so when I can find ways of integrating assessment into activities we're already doing, um, where it doesn't feel like an assessment, and where like I'm enjoying it as well, I really find that the student buy-in is a lot like uh, it's just easier. And I'm and I think tours can be a really great way to do that. It can be really creative thinking through something like writing a script, um, uh, thinking through performance and presentation skills, the ways you could integrate um, sensory tours into it, thinking about things like texture and scent. I really liked what Chris was talking about in terms of thinking about something like rosemary, like scent and taste are two of the senses that I find in an elementary school environment are like really taken out of that context. And I think the more you can bring them in, the better, like it's such a wonderful thing to include in, in teaching practice, so. Um, and uh, I've written this here, but thinking through like how you could connect if you have a buddy program in your school, thinking about how you might be able to use that opportunity both for assessment and social connection um, and, and that kind of knowledge exchange between a, a more senior student and maybe someone who's very new to the school. Um, yeah. Anyway, next slide, please, Tessa. Um, and then another way to think about tours where I was saying, like, how are we inviting people into the um, into the garden is just thinking about um, how we can double up with a community tour here. So how we're inviting new people into the garden. Um, it's a way of approaching volunteer recruitment and orientation. Also a way to receive knowledge from other like 
from our community. So I think sometimes the school is thought of this entity that is the um, where the knowledge is kind of coming from, but I think really having lots of opportunity to bring knowledge into the space and ask people who are in your community to come in and share with students is a really great great thing to be able to do. And then having students be able to share that back out with the community is great. All right. And um, all right. So garden recipes and tasting. Um, I'm going to try, um, this is certainly not like a, an overview of all of the possible ways that you could uh, engage with food, um, like working with food. And, um, but I do think it's a really great thing to think about, um, about tasting and about ways of bringing students into the space in that way. Um, so sometimes I think in June, it can be hard to think what are we, we might not have a lot growing in the garden at this point. We might, depending on where we are. So um, things like lettuce, spinach, kale, herbs, um, turnips, radishes, even if you're doing it in a really tiny um, quantity, I think that engagement or that experience of pulling something out of the garden and tasting it can be very, very powerful. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tessa. So in terms of thinking about the curriculum, when we're creating an opportunity for students to be tasting food um, right out of the garden or to be making or, uh, recipes or cooking together, we're having an opportunity to hit parts of the curriculum like building descriptive vocabulary, thinking about developing observational skills, developing poetic language, um, having those social and connective experiences, sharing with our peers, um, we're embedding its assessment and uh, formative assessment, uh, thinking and sharing or teaching and sharing knowledge, and then also data collection and sorting. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tessa. So this is an example. Um, Tessa's going to put this into the chat later, but this is um, uh, a screenshot of the one of the um, templates that we have on our Hands on Food website. And this gives you a really great sense of what that data collection could look like. And it's a really great um, form to be able to go in thinking about what does it look like? What does it smell like? Um, and what does it taste like? And something, if you can go to the next slide, Tessa, um, something that I've really tried to do with my class, something that I took for granted at the beginning is thinking like, oh, we might already have this vocabulary in our uh, uh, available to us, but um, especially I find taste and scent vocabulary are ones that are difficult for, for all of us in particular, like um, thinking through like, how do we feel things? We can feel things, the texture of it with our hands, but we're when we're eating, we're also feeling the texture of that with our mouths. So when we're thinking through like how we might be able to describe something that we're eating, um, yeah, that's just like a process to kind of uh, work through and kind of work on building the vocabulary. I think it can also be like a really good source point for things like spelling tests if you run a sp spelling program. Great. Next slide, Tessa. Um, so this is an example of something that you could make with like a perennial, um, if you have rhubarb in your garden. Um, and you maybe you don't have enough to go all the way to be able to make a pie or do some kind of baking with it, and you might not have the time. A rhubarb shrub is like a really fun way to kind of work with rhubarb to make, again, if you're not making iced tea, um, it's just kind of mixing rhubarb, sugar, and vinegar, and kind of building a bit of a rhubarb syrup that you might be able to mix with something like sparkling water or water. Uh, the next one is, uh, again, thinking through making a garden iced tea. Um, I was looking on, um, I think, the Project Web uh, Chef website recently, and they have really great videos about thinking about how to process herbs. So even if you're not familiar with like how to do that, their YouTube videos, I think, are so short and simple. So when you're thinking about how are we collecting these um how are we collecting this? And then how are we working through that process to put them into things? Um, again, thinking about measurements or counting or uh, ratios. Those are really great things to work through in terms of curriculum and recipes. And next slide, please, Tessa. Yeah, and a simple salad dressing. Again, even if you don't have enough ingredients to build a full salad, I think even the process of like um, 
you know, salad dressing is great in terms of thinking of how to make an emulsion, thinking through mixtures and science curriculum um, and math curriculum, and then um, even just being able to dip something into a salad dressing can be like a good process. And um, I think for me, like keeping it simple is a really great approach to some of those things because it can feel like really daunting maybe to host like a giant celebration with lots of food and people bringing those things in together. But I think there's still a lot of opportunity for sharing food. And I think kids are really excited about it when you do get an opportunity to do it. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm done. Great. <laughs> Thank um, you, Kayla. I'm going to pass it over to Tessa then. Thanks, Tessa. If anyone else was inspired by Kayla's amazing vegetable haikus, feel free to write your own and pop it in the chat bar. <laughs> I feel like haikus are such a wonderful, approachable structure to poetry to engage kids and also us adults. Um, I'd love to read some more. So if you have a vegetable you'd like to make an O2, put it in the chat bar. Um, so for our last section today, we're going to be discussing supporting the garden through staff turnover. This time of year in the teaching world, we're often thinking ahead to September and our new teaching assignments. Um, but in doing so, recognizing that likely there's some transitions that are gonna happen around the school garden in terms of who's been engaged this year, thinking ahead to next year. Um, these transitions can be particularly challenging if there's been one strong champion that's been running the garden for many years. Um, this is a common challenge for school gardens. I feel like as a community animator, this is something I so commonly hear of how do we have continuity in our school garden dealing with so many changing systems around us. Um, so by no means do I have a golden answer for this challenge, um, but I do have some kind of tricks and ways that we can plan ahead for these challenges um, that I'm going to share with you today. In going through this, I realized that there's a real theme um, to the subject and a lot of the things that I'm going to be suggesting for how to support the garden through turnover is about building resilience in your school garden. So building a resilient people community and a resilient plant community to help that garden weather uh, the changes year to year. So I think we could perhaps rename this section as uh, building resiliency into your school garden. So that's the approach we're going to be taking from it. Oh, there's already a haiku in the chat bar. Great. I love it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start this conversation with thinking back to our January workshop um, where we talked about the importance of building a garden committee. I feel like this is something that primary school BC has really been stressing um, in terms of the way we see setting yourself up for success in the school garden. Um, instead of focusing on having one champion that runs the school garden, how can you build a committee around you um, to support the school garden? So perhaps you have your committee up and running, that's awesome. Um, but maybe, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to develop a committee. Uh, June is not too late. June could be a great time of year to look at the folks that have been involved in the school garden so far um, in this school year and bring those people together to help some visioning and planning ahead for the fall and formalizing some sort of committee structure and roles within the people that have been participating in the school garden to help develop a system um, to work through in the fall, especially if there's some transitions or some turnover happening. Um, if you'd like to learn more about forming a garden committee, if you look back on the program library website to our January workshop, we talk about how to build a garden committee, how to set common goals, how to plan with a committee, and how to bring more members and community into that committee. Um, so take a look at the January workshop for more information on that. If you do have your committee up and running, June's also a great time to check in with your committee. Um, think ahead to September, look at who's returning. Are there any not just committee members that are transitioning, but perhaps there's some key parents that are also moving on from the school. So look at what roles, what capacity might be changing for next year and make sure that for those folks that are moving on, you've documented their jobs, their roles and their contact information to be able to keep some continuity of their knowledge going as well. Um, beyond just your school garden committee, um, we really encourage you to build a network out into the community. And this was the, one of the themes of our workshop last uh, month. So if you want to go back to the May workshop and learn more about how to engage your community, um, we talked about some neat examples like on program happening up north where master gardeners are volunteering in a school garden over the summer. Um, we've also looked at programs where they work with community partners and nonprofits that come in and do summer programming in the school garden. Um, we're also looking at opportunities where high school students are completing their service hours by coming back and volunteering in elementary school gardens. Um, there's also great examples of um, parents and seniors and neighbors um, helping support the school garden, not just over the summer, but also throughout the whole year. So really thinking how, how can we build a web around our garden, which makes it more resilient to that change when our staff does turn over, there's still other systems around there that are supporting the continued culture um, and activities that go on in the garden. 
Um, so not only do parents and admin and uh, teachers move on, our students move on too. And students hold a wealth of knowledge about the school garden um, and about the culture of that garden. And so it's um, an opportunity to think about ways that we can link students across schools to their garden. So perhaps there's an elementary school student that's moved on. How can we bring them back in their high school role to support the garden, perhaps doing some leadership in the garden, supporting a work party in the garden? And likewise, how can high school students that move on, how can we bring them back as alumni into those school gardens? Um, we have a little video posted on our program library page about a great example of an elementary school and a high school working together uh, in Parksville on Vancouver Island. It's just a two minute video. Um, so check that out if you're looking for some inspiration of how you can link elementary school and high school students. Um, there's also a great example on Vancouver Island at a high school where the high school is creating an eco club and they have a whole their own garden committee. It's a student garden committee and they have great ability to transition um, between year after year by forming an executive in their garden committee. Um, so there is great examples of that student leadership and providing that longevity over time. Um, so we've talked a lot about how can we build resilience into our people communities around our garden, but we also want to think how can we build resilience into our plant communities. Um, so planting perennials is a wonderful opportunity to develop some longer term plants that need less ongoing maintenance um, to support the garden over the long term. Perhaps this is a year where you have a lot of energy to put into the garden. Use that energy to plant some perennials. Plan ahead for those years when there might be less engagement and less maintenance in the garden. Perennials can provide a great continuity for students to revisit the same plant year after year and learn about that plant cycles, familiarize themselves with that plant. Um, so yes, the chat bar started great. But into the chat, what are your favorite perennials to grow in a school garden? Um, and the first one's just come in, crisp figs. Oh my gosh, wow. Many kids probably have not eaten a fresh fig. Many adults haven't. Um, and yes, we live in the Mediterranean climate, so it's, we can grow figs. Uh, raspberries, strawberries, chives, sorrels coming in. I was going to share one while a few more people are typing. I don't know if folks have heard of Egyptian walking onion, but it's a plant that's fascinating to kids. It's an onion that grows up and instead of growing flower and seeds, it grows little onion bulbs on the top. And when those onion bulbs get so heavy, the stem falls over and those bulbs get planted again in the garden. So essentially the onion walks along in the garden, plant, replanting itself every year with its own bulbs. So a neat way to have uh, year after year onions in your garden. Lots are coming in the chat bar. I love, I'm seeing some um, flowering red currant and salal. Need to think of native perennials too, not just edible plants, although those are edible plants, but also how can we plant native ed edibles, um, much more adapted to our current climate and the pollinators as well. Pink currants, a must. Yes, currants. Perennial arugula. Um, yeah, I don't know if that works up north, but down on the coast, it's a really wonderful spicy arugula. If people haven't heard of it, but a great way to have arugula year after year. Goji berries, borage, calendula, dill, fennel, lots of herbs. This is an awesome list. Um, I'll share with you folks a few of the ones um, that I really like for school gardens. And so someone already mentioned this on the list, sorrel. Sorrel is one of my favorite for school gardens. I feel like we try to weave it into every workshop. We bring it up. Um, <laughs> it's great to harvest in the spring and the fall. And it's a leaf with a just wonderful lemon bite to it. So really appealing to kids. Um, rhubarb, we've already mentioned, and strawberries. Another June bearing, which is really nice for folks that want to get their fruit in uh, while the uh, class is still in session. Um, Speaking of berries, there's lots of berry bushes. I'm hearing everberry and raspberries come in. Berrying bushes that do produce in the summer, like the everberry and raspberries, everberry and strawberries, are great, especially if you have um, volunteers coming in the summer. It's really nice to treat the volunteers to something tasty that they can be eating during the summer. Um, currants, I think, are really nice, low maintenance, summer producing um, edible shrub as well. Um, and we've already mentioned tea herbs and culinary herbs. Um, lemon balm and mint kind of grow everywhere. They can be invasive in your garden, but um, kids love them. So that's a great thing to include. But there's some more unusual ones too. Stevia can be a neat one to grow to add sweetness to things. Lemon thyme is one of my favorite culinary herbs that you just like walk by it and just like wash this aroma of lemon into the air. Um, so perhaps you already have some of the tea herbs and culinary herbs, but see if you can get some of the more obscure varieties for your garden too. They can really appeal to the students. So think perennials. I see another note from Chris there. Potatoes will perennialize. Yeah. Pretty hard to remember to dig them all up. <laughs> and the beauty of that is you get a volunteer potato again. Um, so yes, and potatoes are just so fun uh, with kids. 
If you are excited about perennials, um, you might want to look into the idea of putting a food forest into your garden. This can start small and be one guild. A food forest is a permaculture culture, a permaculture idea where you grow a group of plants together utilizing vertical space. So often you have a fruit tree and then smaller edible shrubs below and other layers below that. And it can be an neat way to build perennials into your garden centered around one little area, one little guild ecosystem of edible shrubs. If this idea excites you, reach out to me by email. Um, I love the idea of food forestry and I've worked in some community food forest projects. Um, and I'll also put a link onto our program library um, sharing some more information about food forestry. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of um, planning for transitions in school gardens, I wanna share a bit of an aha moment that I had at our Farm School BC conference a couple weeks ago. I was in a workshop put on by Megan Zinni and Sarah Regan. And if you haven't, if you don't know Megan Zinni, you gotta, gotta check her out. She's just this like uh, school food guru and has an amazing website and we'll put a link to that. Um, there's so much to learn from her. But what I took away from this one um, is that she was talking about what are the reasons why we garden in schools, especially elementary schools. And she said food production doesn't even make the list of the top 10. Um, up there at the top is social and emotional learning. And it just really made me think about the importance of letting go of the pressure to produce food in your school garden and broadening this web of how can we look at all the different goals, all the different reasons and benefits and impacts that school gardens have, not just focusing on the food production and then looking at that broader picture, how are we inviting more people into the garden space? Perhaps there's a teacher that has no, doesn't have green thumb, has no interest in producing food, but loves to use the space for silent reading. Or maybe there's another teacher um, that loves to join the space, not even with their class, but like before school for their own personal wellness to do some watering once a week. Um, Maybe there are students that go into the garden just because it's a quiet place to be and enjoy that for recess time. And the more we can see these multiple benefits of the garden, the more we can draw more people in and invite more people to participate. And I think in terms of building a resilient system, the more different um, ways that people are coming into the garden, the different skills that they're bringing and the different impacts that they're seeking out of that garden builds that larger resilient system that can morph and change over the years as different interests, as different strengths come into the garden. Um, and again, there's that picture again of John Barsby School Garden, which is a long lasting school garden that um, Farmer Brown had supported through um, as well. And I just think it's such a neat example of a space that's changed over time, it's full of perennials, and is really inviting so many different purposes and people into that space. Um, so we're, we're running, we're almost at the end of our time here. Um, but I just wanted, maybe this is just a question you can think of. And if you have a moment to put into chat, Curious what draws you into the school garden. And perhaps this is just a personal reflection to let you wonder why is it that I garden? I know for me, a lot of it is about just being in a quiet space, learning from nature alongside students. Um, and Kaylin has a quick thought to share on that as well. Yeah, when we were preparing the um, presentation, I just, I had shared with Tessa at the school that I went, I went to elementary school at, we had a garden and um, the school librarian ran it and, and he called that space the refuge. And I think it really set up um, the, the sort of uh, idea within the school community that this was a place to go and there were protocols around being in that space in a particular type of way. And I think it really allowed students to really know that like um, slowness, contemplation, like those kinds of pacings were, there was a space for that in the school. And it was, uh, I think, incredible the way that that like set that up for everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Kaylin. Yeah, I just encourage us all to think about, yeah, how can we look at our garden more broadly and how can we invite in participation through that to create this more resiliency in our systems? So that concludes um, our workshop today. Just a reminder that our discussion group is next Thursday at 3.30, and we are combining two topics for this discussion group. So we're looking at our summer maintenance and volunteer management, which we discussed in our May workshop, as well as the content that we discussed in this workshop, looking at spring harvest um, and celebrations, and well as just looking ahead to the summer. So our discussion groups are a great informal opportunity to come together with other folks that are engaged in their school garden, work together, problem solve, talk about inspirations and solutions to some of the challenges we may be experiencing. So that's next Thursday, June 15th at 3.30. And our next workshop is next is the September, next school season. Um, so we'll be jumping back into this on Tuesday, September 12th, looking at harvesting and seed saving. Please reach out to Kaylin and myself. We love to hear from you. Um, reach out with questions, with thoughts, with things to share. 
um, from what you listened to in the workshop today. And we also have our listserv and you can reach out to us and we can also post questions to the listserv to help reach out to the broader community too. So it's wonderful to have you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy June schedule on this brilliant sunny afternoon to come chat with us about school gardens. Wish you a wonderful rest of the day.